So, um, let me welcome Professor Soria. Uh, carry on, Jean-Charles. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, it's my privilege to share with you today um, the data regarding uh, the blockade of PDL1 uh, in non-small cell lung cancer. So, I'm going to share a brief update on the clinical activity, the safety, and the biomarkers of MDPL, which is an IgG1 monoclonal antibody against PDL1. As you may be aware, building an anti-tumor immune response is a stepwise process that is summarized in this slide with different steps, starting from the release of uh, antigens from the cancer cells to the generation of an immune response to activate the T8 uh, cells. Uh, however, uh, this immune response can be counteracted by the expression of a molecule called PDL1 by the tumor cells and by the immune infiltrating cells. So, if you want, PDL1 can be considered as a diplomatic immunity that the tumor cells are going to show to the infiltrating activated T cells that will leave them alone. So blocking that diplomatic immunity with an antibody that blocks PDL1 can restore anti-tumor T cell activity. First, the safety. This compound is extremely well tolerated, mainly grade 1 and 2 AEs. One single case of an immune-related severe uh, toxicity, which was a, a patient with hyperglycemia. So, no uh, grade 3, 5 pneumonitis. This is different from what has been reported with anti PD1 antibodies, who have all reported uh, autoimmune pneumonitis. Second, uh, the response rate. And I think uh, this is extremely exciting. Uh, first, there is an overall response rate of 21% across all cancer types. This phase one trial enrolled many different tumor types, not only non small cell lung cancer, but also breast cancer, colorectal cancer, gastric, breast, lymphomas, sarcomas. In every single tumor type, an objective response has been observed. The overall response rate in all tumor types is 21%. If you focus in non-small cell lung cancer, the overall response rate, as you can see, is 23%. But the most interesting thing is that we have data that suggests that we may have found a very robust predictive biomarker of the activity of the compound. As response rate increases with pdl one expression in the immune infiltrated cells that uh, are uh, seen in the tumor. You see there is a relationship. The higher the IHC level, the higher the objective response rate. Second, are these responses transient or durable? Well, they are outstandingly durable. Every single patient who had a response is still in response with the exception of one patient, that is the one with the red triangle. All others are still in response. And the median duration of response here is 48 weeks. This is data cut off as of April of this year. And as to my knowledge, those patients are still in response as of today, although the data has not been cleaned. Second, very and last important information is the fact that uh, you might be aware that somatic mutations are common in most solid tumors. Well, among solid tumors, uh, here in red, lung tumors have one of the highest rates of somatic mutations. But we also know that even among uh, those ones, sorry, the tumors that are raised uh, in smokers have even a higher load of mutation. And the literature has recently suggested that there might be a relationship between the mutational tumor load in a tumor that is higher in the smokers and the immunogenicity of the tumor. So we looked in our patients whether the smoking status, something very simple to measure, contrary to the mutational load, will impact the objective response rate to MPDL. So we have 81% of patients who are smokers or former smokers and 19% who were never smokers. And bingo, this is the first targeted agent that is showing more activity 
in smoking patients than in never smokers. This is extremely important as most advances over the last 10 years in non-small cell lung cancer have been achieved in never smokers where you found the oncogene addiction, EGFR mutations, alt translocation. So this is very good news for lung cancer as a global entity, but specifically for smokers who still are the majority of lung cancer patients. Thank you. Thank you very is this working? Thank you very much, um, you, John Charles. I'm Dr. Cora Sternberg. I'm the co-scientific chair of the meeting. I apologize for being late. I'd like to open this um, presentation for questions because John Charles has to go to another meeting. So we're going to have questions after this presentation. Are there any questions? Yes? Can you please identify yourself? Thank you. Sosha Chistaka, Medscape Oncology. Do you think that the um, findings uh, you can extrapolate to other PD uh, drugs. Yeah, I think that uh, that is going to be one of the key questions. Is 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 this true also for PD1 antibodies like nivolumab that are quite advanced in uh, development? Uh, my personal assumption is this should be true. Then the second question is: Is this true beyond the setting of lung cancer? Is it true for melanomas and other tumor types? And I think that data needs to be looked at. I'm not sure the CRFs that have captured melanoma activity of PD-1s capture the smoking status, but I think it's something that needs to be looked at. And my other question is a bit more general. Can you talk a bit uh, more generally about the idea of immunotherapy working in lung cancer? I mean, is that quite surprising? Um, I would say yes, it's surprising because we have witnessed 30 years of investment where uh, very little activity was seen, uh, notably in uh, solid tumor types that were not melanoma nor renal cell carcinoma. So I, I used to belong to the immunoskeptical world of oncologists, but you know, here we have such a level of activity. This is a monotherapy that is giving IV weekly. Uh, with almost very limited side effects. 55% of the patients uh, that uh, were enrolled in that trial with lung cancer got more than three lines of therapy. And you see a quarter of them with objective responses that are maintained for more than six months. I mean, there is no discussion. This is really working. And uh, it's new. And uh, well, the fact that we have a drug that allows the lymphocytes to go, to go and have a war with the tumor is a great news. Thank you. A question over here? You can. Okay. Thank you. Sylvie Lapostol from APM in Paris. And what is the plan now to go on and uh, have you started already phase two studies or more? Bonjour, Sylvie. Uh, yes, there are multiple studies that are either ongoing or plan with uh, MDPL, um, both in uh, diagnostic selected PDL1 positive patients and all comers, either as a monotherapy or in combination with chemo or other targeted agents. It's a huge development plan that Genentech is developing. The question here. Go ahead. Go ahead, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, it's Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So, in melanoma, where they've tried to use uh, PDL uh, expression as a biomarker, you really can't because patients who don't have it are, are responding. Yes, you have better response with the with a high level, but you still have response. You couldn't really use it and, di and deny it. And how does that work in lung? That's an interesting ethical question, correct? Is um, uh, and it's also a financial question. Uh, I think that uh, PDL1 expression in the tumor is going to enrich for the percentage of patients with an objective response. But I agree with you. There still will be a few patients with a PDL1 status negative with response. But that, in fact, is the reflection of the timing of the biopsy. The data here and all the data ever presented has been mostly done with archived material. So it's not because your archived material is PDL1 positive that your tumor at the time of therapy is not PDL1 positive, correct? There can be a discrepancy. So if you stain for PDL1 in something that is a two years old resected block, 
And between that resection and today, when you are exposed to the component, you have had many lines of therapy. Maybe your PDL1 status has changed. So that is one of the potential explanations of why you may have responses in PDL negative patients. Question in the back. No, no, it's coming. You, go ahead, sir. It's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Pierre Duar from uh, Belgian Oncology News. How could you explain the um, difference on uh, adverse effect uh, between PD-1 and PD-L1? I, this is not a head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, it's an indirect comparison. But one of the key elements uh, of the mechanistic difference when you block PDL1 as compared to PD1 is the fact that when you block PDL1, you leave intact an axis that is very important, which is the PDL2 PD1 axis that you will, of course. Uh, block if you use an anti PD1. And the PDL2 PD1 axis is important because PDL2 is expressed in many organs, including the lung, and therefore that may be the explanation of having lesser autoimmunity. Come to the presentation. I have 20 slides there and very nice uh, <laughs> slides to, to try to clarify that. Here I had Fantas five slides. Fantastic. Question? Simeon Bennett from Bloomberg News. Um, this is kind of an ethical question as well, but assuming that the same data, we see the same kind of effect in, in phase three and this drug is, is approved and so on, um, what's going to be the utility of this drug in emerging market developing countries where the smoking rates are highest and accelerating, uh, but where the technology may lag for actually detecting the biomarkers to identify the patients that would benefit from this drug? Um, whereas smoking rates are declining in the developed countries that have the technology. Thanks. I think uh, PDL1 expression by immune to chemistry is uh, a low hanging fruit even for any developing country. I am sure that Bolivia or uh, India have very robust pathology labs that can do an immune staining. Uh, it's just that there is a clinical grade kit that is released. Currently it's a proprietary kit from Roche, uh, Genentech, Ventana. But uh, this is a biomarker that is easy and it should not be very difficult to implement. Then the question will be of course the cost of the drug, but that's a completely different discussion. So the diagnostics will be eventually very important in choosing mm -hmm. those patients to treat. Do we have other questions? Yes? Yeah. Peter Goodwin, Oncology Times. Uh, how do you see this uh, potentially fitting into the clinical picture for the practicing oncologist in, in um, Europe and America, for instance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really think this is going to be a game changer. Uh, Clearly. First, because, you know, as I told you, it works notably in smokers, which haven't had much to, as good news in the recent years. Maybe because it works in smokers, it's working so well in squamous, because as you will see, the data we have uh, activity as good in squamous as in adenocarcinomas. And, you know, patients who will be uh, in second, third line will probably have the choice of getting this drug with very limited AEs as compared to some of our old cytotoxic chemotherapies with the balding effects and all the hematological side effects. So I think this is really going to be a game changer. That's a tougher question. Um, I think the first uh, way to go is uh, as a monotherapy. But yes, sure, combination is uh, another option, either with uh, chemotherapy or with other targeted agents. The problem with chemotherapy is, of course, that most chemotherapy needs steroids. And if you put steroids when you are trying to build an immune response, it's a little bit counterintuitive. So that is going to be the trickiness of uh, uh, the situation. Question in the front. Uh, Lynn Peterson again with Trends in Medicine. So if this works this well, why would it come after the other therapies? That's an excellent question. Uh, some of the um, trials that are being planned will include first-line patients. But uh, you know, uh, you need to demonstrate superiority to randomization, at least in Europe. You have seen the recent example of crizotinib that was made available to European citizens two years after the US citizens, which got it on the basis of a phase one and a phase two and the robustness of the reproduction of the activity. Well, in Europe, we say we need to randomize, and well, they were randomized. So, but this is a relevant question, yeah. 
I think this is a fantastic new game changer for patients with, uh, uh, who are smokers. We have nothing in the past. I have just one question for you. Um, there are a few patients who were non-smokers. Is it possible that those patients were treated on other studies that had adenocarcinomas and were treated with other um, molecular targeted agents? And that's perhaps why they didn't respond, those few patients? Um, yes, well, that's, that data needs to be looked at in detail. And, uh, um, in fact, 60% of the patients were EGFR wild type. There were a few EGFR mutants, and we are looking at what is the response rate in the EGFR mutants as compared to the others. I think we will present that data at World Lung Cancer. That's wonderful. So I think this is a, definitely a game changer and great news for patients who, are, who have lung cancer, both probably, especially smokers, but probably also non-smokers. Thank you very much. I know you have to thank, run off to thank a presentation. Thank you, Corinne. Apologies to thank my co-speaker.